This video and every video on this channel is made possible by your support on patreon.com slash 616 entertainment. I couldn't do this without you and your contributions keep this channel alive. You can also grab an official shirt over on prowrestlingtees.com slash 616 entertainment. Oh, what's up, Dan Dans? Welcome to Mortal Kombat Monday. My name is Ian, and yes, indeed, as you can tell by the title and the thumbnail, it is time to dig deeper into the Mortal Kombat novel written by Jeff Rovin. Now, if you are clicking on this video, that means you have probably listened to prior episodes where I've read through this novel. We are starting on chapter 30 this time. Uh, so you, you're already well acquainted, I would assume, with the fact that this book sucks the writing is not good, and uh, they've taken massive liberties with a number of these characters, and I'm going to do goofy-ass voices and impressions for everybody, and it's going to be a good goddamn time. Do you understand? We're going to have some fun here. Or we're not. You don't have to listen to it. Turn it off if you don't like it. <laughs> but I've promised that we would finish this novel, and we're going to dig deeper into it today. Uh, we'll probably have another installment of this before it's all said and done but you know let's uh let's get through about four or five chapters here today patch what do you think uh, that's a good idea i agree chapter 30 we're on page 213 here he moved with the speed far greater than human shortly after sunrise the nimbosity that was kano and kung lao reached the foothills of mount angelus the long-ago Mount Ikafube and drifted swiftly past the ancient caves of the monks of the Order of Light, along the cliff faces themselves to the heights where the gods dwelt in their temples. The gray, living fog poured up toward the Temple of Raiden, whose columns and facade were as radiant as they had been fifteen centuries before. Cared for by the monks, kept fresh by the crisp mountain air, and preserved by the very purity of the soul of the god the temple honored. As Kano Kung neared, Kano Kung? What? Are we calling Kano and Kung Lao Kano Kung? What the fuck is that about? Hold on, we're getting interrupted already. The one and only Patches Lugosi is sitting next to me on the couch and he wants to go down his ramp. I bought him a ramp, guys. He's gonna be 13 in January. And I bought him a ramp so he doesn't keep. Whoa! And then he jumped off the side of the ramp. The whole point! was that he doesn't hurt his goddamn joints. He's getting old, I'm trying to help him, but he says, nope, I'm gonna keep jumping. Anyway, as Kano Kung neared, a dullness seemed to fall over the blue, white alabaster and brilliant gold that symbolized the moon and the sun. The shadow of corruption that the unholy hybrid brought with it. Guided by Kung's knowledge, which he was unable to suppress, the Kano side of the creature moved toward the rock where, long ago, Kung Lao I had entombed the sacred amulet of Raiden. The humanoid smoke stopped in front of the stone which bore the scars of the battering Kung Lao had given it, still fresh as the day they were made. With something that looked like a smile on his distorted face, Kano moved closer, his thick fingers thinning- What? His thick fingers thinning and becoming tenuous, snaking behind the rocks and through the cracks, feeling their way with phantom-like delicacy. And then the smile became fixed and wide as he found what he was looking for. Willing the fingers to become more material once again, Kano pulled the stones forward. They fell around and through him, and there it was before him. Glowing white and gold in the sunlight, he slipped his airy fingers through the stiff, ratty leather strap, pulled the amulet to him, then turned and glided down the mountain. Behind him, the full luster of the temple did not return, as its heart was carried away by the adulterated child of wickedness. I have no fucking idea what that chapter just said at all. Not a clue. What the fuck are they talking about? Kano Kung? Kano and Kung Lao are mixed together? I don't remember this at all. From the prior chapters. What? The full luster of the temple did not return as its heart was... What the fuck are you talking about, Jeff Rovin? This fucking book sucks. Chapter 31. Yes, chapter 30 was only a page and a half long. Sub-Zero surveyed his handiwork as he slipped the knife-tipped pole from his back. 
The effects of the cold will wear off shortly, he said. When they do, you'll want to be prepared to dispatch your friend. He's conscious inside there, can hear everything we say, see everything we do. I imagine that he'll be rather annoyed with us all. Goro agreed, lumbering behind the ice containing Raiden. He wrapped his arms around the block and lowered it to the ground. Think you can hit him this time? Goro asked. Reptile approached with a slow, slithering gait. I was struck from the inside by a new assailant, Goro. However, you had no excuse for that charge when he disappeared. My excuse was that he disappeared, Goro said. I knew nothing about his lightning, but I didn't know Raiden could teleport. Sub-Zero's ears perked. Raiden, I've defeated a god? You had help, Reptile said, bending over the head of the frozen deity. He let the acid run through his mask, and the ice began to evaporate in billowing, sizzling clouds. Did I? Sub-Zero said, tapping his chin through his mask. When I arrived, he appeared to have the two of you at a disadvantage. Perhaps we let him up again and see how you would fare. Uh, okay, well this next quote, they're not telling me who it's from, so I'm just going to say it in my voice. In a fair fight, a voice rang out from the direction of the sun. The three hench beings looked over, squinting red, green, and human eyes into the light. They saw no one, then leapt aside as a pair of short-stemmed harpoons screamed towards them. The barbs snagged the frozen heroes in the ice between their feet, and as the servants of Shang Tsung watched, the two blocks were quickly drawn away from them. An instant later, the air between them wriggled and darkened and a figure materialized in their midst. A man clad in black and gold, his face all but hidden behind a gold mask. The newcomer faced Sub-Zero, so clearly it's Scorpion. What kind of voice should I do for Scorpion? Um, I don't know, because Sub-Zero, I'm trying to do like an MK11 Sub-Zero. I guess Scorpion will be calmer, but it's, it's going to sound relatively similar. I can only do so many voices, guys. You defeated a god with the help of two others, fiend. The same number it took to help you beat an unarmed man. Sub-Zero moved so fast that uh, his face was flushed and close to that of the newcomer. Don't come to my battlefield and lecture me, pup. Don't you dare. Stop me, said the youth. In time, Sub-Zero replied. I'll stop you, Goro grunted. He ground his upper left fist into his bottom right palm and the upper right into the bottom left. I'll rip your living heart out. I don't like braggarts. Calm yourself, Goro, Sub-Zero said. What is your name, boy? I am Scorpion, said the youth. Sub-Zero snickered. I've eaten Scorpion and had Scorpion soup. I can't say I cared for either. Now, Tarantula Stew... You murdered a toll taker, Scorpion cut in. He was a gracious and blameless man, a gentle husband, and caring father. Ah, Sub-Zero said, you are the son. Enough talk, Scorpion said. It's time to answer for your crimes. Will you make us all answer? Sub-Zero sneered. A crocodilian glint in his eyes. He spit acid at the costumed figure. The acid passed harmlessly through Scorpion as he faded and rematerialized several paces behind the group. The trio turned as one. I'll fight anyone who tries to help this fiend, Scorpion vowed. From behind the three villains, a familiar voice said, and I don't know who the fuck it is. Uh, I guess it's Liu Kang. I don't remember what my Liu Kang voice was. <laughs> and we will help him, cowards! Reptiles, Sub-Zero, and Scorpion spun again. Liu Kang, Goro blared. And Raiden, Sub-Zero croaked as his green eyes settled on the blue and white figure standing beside Liu Kang. Scorpion seemed to stand a little taller. I said it was time, Sub-Zero. Turn and face me. The ninja's head turned around and the rest of his body followed a moment later. He casually hooked his thumbs inside his black sash belt then slipped his index fingers in beside them. I've turned, he said. I'm facing you. I'm forgetting whose voice belongs to who. <laughs> Scorpion's arms were stiff at his sides. He bent them at the elbow so that the flats of his forearms were facing at Sub-Zero. He bared blinkly. Bare, he barely blinked. I had a fucking stroke right there. He barely blinked as he watched the ninja, waited for him to make a move. 
Will you shoot me? Sub-Zero asked as he began circling his opponent. Once in the leg to slow me. Once in the side to bring me down. Once in the belly so that I bleed to death slowly, painfully. Scorpion turned as Sub-Zero did. He wasn't frightened, but his heart, beating for two, himself and his father, was thumping madly. I will fight fairly, Scorpion told him, which is more than you've ever done. True, Sub-Zero said. He removed his fingers from his belt, then quickly folded them into fists. So I ask, young Avenger, why should I start now? Sub-Zero dropped to the ground, and as he did so, black smoke erupted everywhere, billowing from the ground on all sides. Scorpion held his breath and leapt feet first into the smoke where he'd last seen Sub-Zero. He felt the earth shake, and though he groped wildly, the killer was nowhere to be found. Within moments, Scorpion began to gag from the choking, greasy smoke and willed himself out of the way. He passed through the black limbo of Yu and, still coughing, reappeared several hundred yards beyond the smoke near Liu Kang. The White Lotus fighter had started running toward him when the smoke disappeared. Are you okay? Liu Kang said, putting an arm around Scorpion's shoulder and looking into his eyes. Scorpion nodded vigorously as his eyes swept the grimy, dark air above the field. Did... did you see where he went? He didn't move until the smoke screen was up, Liu Kang said. Typical Liu... take two. Typical Lin Kuei trick. That was a ninja smoke bomb. Oil and tear gas. They're small, under high pressure, and activated by puncturing them with a nail. They have no honor, those devils. Won't fight when they can run. My father had honor, Scorpion said. He was still peering ahead, trying to catch the sight of his foe. That was why he left the Lin Kuei. That was why they killed him. So clearly, still taking some major liberties with these characters. Uh, Sub-Zero killed Scorpion's dad, and uh, Scorpion's dad was a member of the Lin Kuei at one point, apparently, here in this world. I'm sorry, friend. I know how you feel. Liu Kang pressed the button on the side of his watch. None of the numbers lit up, which meant that Sonya was beyond the 100 mile range of the signal in her knife handle. Sub-Zero murdered two of my comrades in the dark, and I fear for the safety of a third. What happened to the other two? Scorpion asked. Goro and Reptile may be big and strong, but they're not stupid, Liu Kang said. They ran off with Sub-Zero. Three against two aren't odds they favor. But how did they get away so fast? Perhaps Sub-Zero didn't, Liu Kang said. A ninja with his experience can dig a ditch in seconds and pull the soil over him. You could be... Take two. You could search for hours and never see the breathing tube. As for the other two, did you feel the ground rumble? That had to be Goro stomping off on those brontosaurus legs of his. He probably had Reptile under one of his arms. Liu Kang watched as the smoke began to dissipate. Or maybe the rumbling was one of Shang Tsung's red lightning sent to collect his lackeys. It's said the wizard can see all. Scorpion took a deep breath and shrugged off Liu Kang's arm. I've got to go after them. Uh, okay, somebody says no. I'm guessing it's Raiden as I'm looking ahead here. No! The voice rumbled from directly behind them, and Scorpion turned to see Raiden standing there, his eyes a flat gold, his expression grim. Fuck. I feel like I'm starting to use my Sub-Zero voice <laughs> as Raiden, or the other way around, I don't know. Um, I don't, I don't know what we're gonna do for Raiden, I'm just gonna make this up on the spot. We will get them later, right now we have another task. You have another task. Fuck, Scorpion and Raiden sound exactly the same. <laughs> Shit. Patch, I don't know how many voices I can do here. Well, try your best. I am, I am trying my best. Um, you have another task, Scorpion said. I won't let Sub-Zero escape. He has already escaped, said Raiden. I have just been to Shang Tsung's island. He gets around, Liu Kang said to Scorpion. Sort of like you do. Liu Kang was correct, Raiden continued. Sub-Zero and the Outworlders fled, and Shang Tsung collected them with his red lightning. He looked at Liu Kang. Sonya Blade is with them, and Kano is on the way. He's whole again? Yes. Did he get the amulet? Raiden nodded. Liu Kang said, Then don't you dare go there, Raiden. All they have to do is touch you with it, and we'll be taking out ads for a new Thunder God. Scorpion said, What was the other task they spoke of, Raiden? 
the Thunder God replied. We must go to my temple on the peaks of Mount Angelus and find Kung Lao. Only the priests can tap the power of the amulet, and we will need that if we are to defeat Shang Tsung and his killers. Liu Kang said, Raiden doesn't get emotional about the things that upset us humans, Scorp. So Liu Kang is calling Scorpion Scorp now. <sighs> Comes with being a god. But much as I want to go to the island now, he's got a point. We're going to Shang Tsung's home turf. If we don't go prepared, we'll get creamed. Scorpion looked from Liu Kang down to his open hands. All of this power, and what have I been able to do with it? I let my prey escape. What have you been able to do? Liu Kang asked. Friend, if you hadn't pulled us to safety, Raiden and I would be both masquerading as basic protoplasm. Take two. Basic, no, protoplasm. That's what the fuck it says. I said it right. Your powers are courage. Guys, I'm losing my mind. Your powers and courage have earned a friend and ally for life, Liu Kang said. And if there's a world beyond this one, you can count on me there as well. Scorpion looked at Liu Kang and his eyes grew moist. So now Scorpion's crying. There is such a life, he said. A part of me has seen it. He looked at Raiden. Show us the way, Thunder God. It's a sight I want my enemies, our enemies, to see. Bruised, dirty, and a bit ragged, the trio set out for the temple, Liu Kang apologizing for holding his companions back, muttering that he'd make his own way if they wanted to teleport ahead, complaining that it wasn't tough enough to just hold his own among gods and dead people and monsters from the outworld. What a horrible fucking sentence that was. Chapter 32, guys. Who is ready for chapter 32? I know I am. How fucking long have I been reading? Only 16 minutes? Wowzers. As the dragon prode boat approached the fog surrounding Shimura Island, Kano felt a chill. There were times in his life where he'd felt like he was in a fog, but just a few hours before, he'd looked like that. He lifted his arms and let the amulet dangle before him. All this fuss and bother for a fancy stone in a weird, liquidy gold setting and a brittle leather strap. He could have lifted one of them emeralds and diamonds worth twice as much from any jewelry store. Of course, it wouldn't have had magic powers. And this one seemed to, though Kano wasn't sure. After he'd picked it up, he'd begun to tingle uncomfortably, like the time he'd never forget when he was a kid and stuck a wet goldfish into an, an electric outlet to try and cook it. <sighs> this is what you read books like this for, right? For flashbacks of Kano sticking goldfish as a child into an electric outlet? The juice went right through the struggling fish into his hand. As he'd floated down the mountainside, his whole body had tingled painfully, and just like his leg did when it woke up after being asleep. Then he hurt so bad he couldn't move at all, and finally, he'd felt a nifting pain, knifing pain. <laughs> Sorry guys, I'm distracted by Patch. On the other side of the room, sniffing so intensely. He's like, <laughs> what are you looking for over there, man? Hey, what are you looking for? Are you hungry? I'll get you some dinners in a minute, okay? Relax. Let's try that again. Then he'd hurt so badly he couldn't move at all, and finally he'd felt a knifing cold pain as though he were being cut into salami-sized slices. A moment later, all the agony had left him, though he felt like someone had parked a brick, a, a Buick on his shoulder. The weight nearly dropped him to his knees, and he'd suddenly realized that he was whole again. He looked to the right, then the left, and saw Kung Lao lying on the ground, the amulet in his hand. Trying to split with the gods, he'd said, snatching it back and kicking Kung Lao in his ribs for good measure. Nice try, but between the two of us, you're the Lao man on the totem pole. Good. Really good. And then Kano headed down the mountain. Though he hadn't gone far when a flash of red smashed him from he had no idea where, giving him a serious headache and causing every hair on his body to stand up and do the dance of the sugar plum fairies. A second later, he was on a beach with a dragon-headed ship bobbing a couple hundred yards away. He'd walked over and boarded, and here he was, rolling into a fog. Yes, that says rolling. R-O-L-L-I-N apostrophe. 
Kano figured that Shang Tsung had been watching him in a crystal ball or something and had sent the red light after Kung Lao had taken Kano to the amulet. But now, as he looked at the little trinket, he wondered if another triple million was worth it. Shang Tsung must want it real bad to have gone through all this trouble. And something else occurred to him. Why would the wizard send a laser beam all that way and then drop him on the beach? Why not bring him right to the palace? Kano rubbed the stubble on his cheek, surprised at how heavy his arm still felt. Maybe, just maybe, he thought, Shang Tsung was running out of juice. And if he was, maybe this bauble was the key to saving his butt. And if it was, it was worth a lot more than three mil. As Kano looked at the hypnotic, opalescent gem in the center of the amulet, he began to wonder if he should give the thing to Shang Tsung at all. Maybe I should hold it for him, he thought, making, uh, we were, there's no quotes here. It's just switching between italics and non-italics, so that's weird. Maybe I should hold it for him, he thought, make him tell me how to work it. Or maybe I should tell him a few things, like I want to share what he's got going on, 50-50. With the possibilities beginning to delight his imagination, Kano watched the play of blue and red light continue to in the center of the amulet, even as the boat entered the fog. And then, a wicked smile turning up the corners of his mouth, he slipped the leather strap over his head, felt the warmth of the golden setting against his chest, and decided that 50-50 was much too generous. Kano had done all the heavy lifting on this. He was the one who had been turned into a fog man and settled... <laughs> Settled with some of the losingest accomplices in caper history, and 9010 was a starting to smell pretty fair to him. <sighs> Chapter 33. Chapter 33. When Raiden, Scorpion, and Liu Kang arrived at the temple, they found Kung Lao half kneeling, half leaning against the altar. He had managed to crawl in from the ledge, light a fire in the coal brazier, and pray to Raiden while attempting to collect his strength. As the trio entered, passing under the scintillating ceiling of frozen lightning, Kung Lao tried to bow toward the Thunder God. Lord Raiden, he said, falling forward onto the white tile floor. Liu Kang and Scorpion ran forward while Raiden stopped in the center of the temple. The two mortals lifted Kung Lao and carried him to one of the two golden chairs on either side of the temple. No, Kung Lao protested, trying to get back to the floor. A priest must kneel in the presence of Lord Raiden. It is true, Raiden strode to Kung Lao's side, put his strong hands on the priest's arms and raised him to his feet. But I know what is in your heart, Kung Lao. You need not kneel to show me your devotion. There were tears in Kung Lao's eyes. Thank you, Lord, but I failed you. The amulet. I was unable to stop myself. I brought Kano right to it. We will deal with Kano and Shang Tsung presently. The god sat Kung Lao in the chair, then faced Scorpion. I sense the presence of two souls. I am son and I am father, Scorpion said. We are under the protection of the demigod Yu. Do you know the location of Shimimura Island in the East China Sea? Scorpion nodded. Raiden turned to Liu Kang. I require your assistance, warrior of the White Lotus. Anything, Raiden, Liu Kang said eagerly. Scorpion and I must go to Shang Tsung's palace at once. You will follow with Kung Lao. Liu Kang's face collapsed. You want us to walk while you teleport there? Raiden and Scorpion vanished. The god in a flash of lightning, Scorpion in a blackening wave. I guess so, Liu Kang said as he looked at the space that the two figures had occupied in a moment before. Why couldn't they take us with them? Because our bodies would not survive the journey through Limbo, Kung Lao said. It is a place for gods and the immortal soul, not for the likes of us. He rose, gripping Liu Kang's arm to steady himself. But though Shimimura Island is far, we can get there today. Soon. How? Is there magic you can use? Kung Lao said. There is. It's a weapon that Shang Tsung gave us without realizing it. So saying, the priest hobbled toward the altar and once again knelt beside it. Join me, he said to Liu Kang. The warrior walked over and dropped to his knees. He watched as the priest shut his eyes, crossed his hands in front of his chest, began rocking back and forth slowly, and recited passages from the sacred scrolls of light. 
It is said that those who believe in divinity of Raiden will exhale the breath of seven colors, all the humors of which humans are capable. Forgive me, Holy One, Liu Kang said quietly, but do you really think that's going to help us now? That while sitting here still, they can still see into all eight points of the world and even to things under the ground that in a tiny dark room or on the blackest night, they are, they are their own light or whatever. Kung Lao bowed his head lower, scrunching his mouth with disgust. Liu Kang did likewise. I still don't get this, he said. Raiden left without us to protect you from harm. Why would he help now? And how? The skies began to grumble, and Liu Kang's eyes shifted from side to side. It comes, said Kung Lao. What does? The key. Liu Kang said impatiently. The key to what? <laughs> the transformation, Kung Lao said as the altar in the walls began to shake. The floor began to crawl, and finally the frozen lightning of the temple ceiling. Take two. The frozen lightning of the temple ceiling began to sparkle and pop before exploding, drawing out the words and fenga spoken by Kung Lao. Chapter 34 is upon us. Can you believe it? Upon arriving at the palace with Shang Tsung, Sonya found herself gripped tightly by countless pairs of hands. Some of the hands were pale, some of them monstrous, but all of them were strong, and they lifted her from the ground before she was able to defend herself. Ugh. Though she made no sound, neither screamed nor swore, hands were clapped on her mouth, piled four thick so that she couldn't even move her head. The owners of the hands all wore hoods, and she noticed that the ones who had ivory-white human hands had black cloaks and seemed to move in slow motion without actually moving slowly, while the hands in the white cloaks moved normally, though their flesh was amber and cracked, like the floor of the driest basin in the hottest desert. desert. Whichever type they were, the hands squeezed so tightly that they hurt, and the reek of the bodies was overpowering, some smelling like damp earth, some smelling like spoiled milk, none of them any good. She heard Shang Tsung say, Take her to the altar of Shao Kahn! And then the crowd of mysterious beings pressed in so close around her that all she could hear after that was a rustle of their cloaks and limbs and the thudding of her own heart. But Sonya couldn't get away, and the vile horde carried her through the palace toward a wide doorway in the back, and she was still too weak to even struggle. Drained and disoriented by her journey through the red aura that separated the outworld from the mother realm, the barrier that had to be breached to move from one world to the other. By simply casting a spell and passing inside of it, one could cover great distances in either realm in a heartbeat, though the trip itself was bludgeoning, as fast as the ride up along a waterfall. Alright, good stuff, Jeff Robin. After a quick passage through the cool morning air, which provided a short but welcome respite from the stench of the creatures that held her... I'm getting a spam call right now. You guys want to listen to it? Yep, that's what I thought. I answered and didn't say anything to see if whoever called would be like, hello, and they didn't. Pussies! Anyway. After a quick passage through the cool morning air, which provided a short but welcome respite from the stench of the creatures that held her, Sonya saw that she was being carried into a towering pagoda. Once through its golden doors, she was taken through an archway that was shaped in the outline of what looked like a horned, somewhat human head, the likeness of Shao Kahn, she imagined. From the corner of her eyes, Sonya saw the line of cloaked and hooded beings on either side, all of them holding lanterns. Behind them, barely illuminated by the light, were delicately painted murals, all in red, showing forests of flame and frenzied figures, some of them human, some of them bizarre hybrids, men with reptilian heads, women with heads of fox and deer, children with bat wings. And then she saw the bodies of her former traveling companions, Michael Schneider and Jim Wu. They were lying face up and shirtless on stone slabs. They were ragged holes in their chest. Above their hearts, hooded figures were standing beside them with sticks poked into the openings. 
and as Sonia watched them remove the sticks and turn to an unfinished mural, she was sickened as she realized the truth. The sticks were brushes, and the murals weren't rendered in red paint. They were drawn in blood. Sonia had no intention of dying for anyone's art, and as she neared a crowd of figures gathered around an empty stone slab at the front of the shrine, she began to wriggle and kick with a fresh sense of purpose. But the hands held her too tightly, and she could do nothing but watch as they bore toward her figure in a red robe. The creature did not wear a hood, and as she neared and saw its face, she couldn't help but wonder why not. It was ugly, this bald thing, with pointed ears, slanted white eyes beneath devilish eyebrows, small diagonal slits for nostrils, and a mouth that was filled with long, sharp, widely spaced metal spikes for teeth. The mouth comprised the entire lower jaw of the creature's face, and followed the jawline in such a way that the thing appeared to have a perpetual grill at- grillin? Grin. Grin is the word I was looking for. But there was no laughter in that nasty mouth or in the slope of the eyes. The otherwise human figure looked up and raised its arms. As the sleeves of its robe slid back along its thickly muscled arms, Sonia noticed that the creature's amber flesh was like that of her white-roped captors. Though this being had long, thin steel blades that had seemed to grow from the back of its forearms, the figure crossed the blades, touched it with a delicate ping, and then looked at Sonya. So we're talking about Baraka here, right? We're talking about Baraka. Baraka. As the, as the announcer would say from Mortal Kombat 2. Bring him forth, he said in a gurgling voice. Oh, this is Baraka. How should Baraka sound? Bring him forth, he said in a gurgling voice that sounded like it came from a Walkman she'd once dropped in a pool. That's an interesting way to describe that. Yes, Priest Baraka, said another gurgling voice in a white hood. Bring who forth, Sonia wondered, as there was movement among the lantern holders to the right, and she prayed that Liu Kang or one of the others hadn't been captured. She didn't know what to think when she saw what two of the white hooded figures were carrying between them. It was a cage made of delicately carved bone, with jade hinges on the door and a jade handle. There were brushes tucked in the belts of the figures carrying the cage. The monster had... What, what was my Baraka voice? The monster has decreed a sacrifice, said Baraka. And we who have come from our world to prepare the way for Shao Kahn and the Mother Realm are honored to comply. That kind of hurts my voice a little bit. The cage was held near the foot of the slab and Sonya saw a beautiful white pigeon inside. Sonya had volunteered to take intensive training in the modern and ancient cults when she joined the U.S. Special Forces, and she knew that certain groups of 17th century New England witches and modern-day voodoo priests sacrificed pigeons in their ceremonies. She wondered if the ancient cult of Shao Kahn was the source of these other forms of black arts. Bring her to me, Shao Kahn, or uh, Baraka said. <laughs> Momentarily distracted by her reverie, Sonya was startled when she was suddenly thrown onto the slab. She landed hard and had the breath knocked out of her, and was unable to resist the waves of hands once again pinned her, holding down her arms and pushing down her waist. Baraka stepped closer. He looked down at Sonya. You are fortunate, he said. So few get to see their own hearts before they die, but my blades work quickly. My own heart, she thought. What happened to the bird? Barack, the, that's, in the, that's in the book, the what happened to the bird. I'm not asking that. Baraka raised his arms so the swords point, pointed straight up. Oh, noble Hamachi, he burbled as the cage was raised higher. Great and devoted messenger to our master. We make this sacrifice so that your likeness may be drawn on the walls of this shrine. In your name, noble bird, do we draw blood. That kind of sounded like Frank Reynolds. They drew first blood. <laughs> I'm going to picture that now throughout this, in fucking, this entire ordeal. <laughs> Oh, shit. Slowly, the priest turned his wrists and pointed the blades towards Sonya's chest. And then in a flash, they plunged down. Dan Dan's, I think on that note, 
We draw this episode of Mortal Kombat Monday to a close. That was five, what, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34. That was five more chapters of the Mortal Kombat novel. We are, uh, we're getting ever closer. We are on page 239 of 290. So I think the next time we read this book, we'll finish it. What do you think about that? Finish him. Is that's what I'm saying about this book next time we read it you let me know when you want me to read this fucking thing next week the week after not till the end of the season you tell me i love you thanks for listening and uh i'll see you next week